Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to just spend a few minutes, uh, and I will stick to my time limit here, because I really want to make sure that we have some time for your questions, because that's really probably the most important part of, of these events. Um, although I'm a federal judge right now, uh, and for a period of time in the 1990s, for four years, I served as the chairman of the federal agency that uh, was charged with finding what were then still secret records from the Kennedy assassination and getting as many of them released as quickly as possible to the public. The law that Congress passed, the President John F. Kennedy Records Collection Act of 1992, was a reaction uh, primarily to, uh, not only to Oliver Stone's movie, which brought this out uh, in to the public a lot more, but to years of dedicated work by researchers who felt that they were still trying to research this important subject with a one arm tied behind their back because of the government records. Uh, so many from the 1960s were still classified. It doesn't take much to classify a record. That's another problem that still exists in Washington today. You just you, you put top secret at the top of it and maybe 30 or 40 years later it might get released. Um, the bill was passed in 1992 by the Congress. Uh, President Bush was uh, empowered to make the appointments. He did not. He had opposed the bill. He thought it was unconstitutional. Uh, and therefore, he ignored the, uh, the impact of the law and it, it fell to President Clinton to make the appointments. Uh, I was nominated by him in September of 1993 and then we were all confirmed a five-member board consisting of myself, the one required lawyer on the board, and four uh, academics, one of whom was a professional archivist, and three were uh, uh, presidential historians. Um, this act put control of declassification of federal records, albeit in a single category, in the hands of an outside independent body for the first time. Uh, we were an independent agency within the executive <coughs> branch, uh, which meant that uh, we were handling executive branch records, which got around the constitutional issue, but we were independent and could not simply be fired by the president. Uh, all government records on the Kennedy assassination were to carry a presumption of openness, and agencies were required to organize all of their files, present them to us, along with arguments for why any particular record should remain sealed. After we made our decision, the agency could appeal our decision to the president. There was no part of this effort that was to go before the courts, the president being ultimately in control of the executive branch records. We were also to do our best to search for state, local, and private records to be part of the collection, and we were empowered to try to clear up as best we could uh, some of the gaps in the evidence. What we were not supposed to do, and we did not do, we held strictly to this, we did not try to decide what happened. The whole goal of this effort was to find all of the records, uh, release them to the extent possible, and re we released just about everything we got our hands on, and then let the public decide. Open the records to researchers, uh, let them look through them, and, uh, and let the public decide what happened. Um, we made several important decisions at the beginning. Uh, all of our decisions were made on a word-by-word -word basis, which means that no uh, entire document was ever sealed or, or kept uh, under wraps by our efforts. Uh, we would occasionally redacted information, not very much. And I can tell you, we did not uh, redact any information that was centrally related to the assassination story. What we did do, we redacted names of certain uh, intelligence agents who were still alive, who felt that their lives would be in danger and compromised if they, it was known publicly that they were CIA agents. We used their pseudonyms instead. But we, for every piece of information that we redacted, we set a release date. And all of those release dates have passed right now. So the only records today that have not been released are a series of uh, records that uh, will be released in 2017. They were not deemed to be centrally relevant to the assassination story, uh, but they contain uh, national security information. Um, the standard that we applied was very interesting. Uh, we had to weigh interests here. Uh, we weighed interests uh, between the uh, public interest in the document and uh, categories like national security, 
uh, disclosure of intelligence gathering methods, personal privacy, and presidential security. Well, with the great interest in Kennedy assassination records, we released just about everything. We found that everything uh, really uh, satisfied that standard. We had a staff of about 30 people. We held public hearings uh, around the country. We defined expansively what an assassination record was. There are those who would argue that President Kennedy was killed, for example, uh, because he was going to withdraw advisors from Vietnam. That's a theory that some people express. We didn't take a, a position on that, but we went out and found all of President Kennedy's administration's records on Vietnam policy and released it. So, I mean, that was the way we did our work, not taking sides in any particular debate, but just getting everything out. We issued over the four years 27,000 plus decisions. There were an additional 33,000 decisions that we called uh, consent releases which was a, a fancy way of saying the agency wanted the information protected, but they knew we weren't going to protect it, so they gave up. Um, there were no successful agency appeals at the White House. President Clinton signaled early on that we were going to do this work and he wasn't going to interfere with it. And the collection includes all the evidentiary material from uh, the, the Warren Commission and includes the voluminous files of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. We found probably about 1.6 million pages of material at the Central Intelligence Agency that all got shipped over to the National Archives and declassified. The total collection today is in excess of 6 million pages. It's the largest single collection at the National Archives in Washington. There's an index to the collection at uh, uh, www.nara, which is National Archives and Records Administration.gov. Um, we had very interesting relationships with the federal agencies who were involved, uh, and in the end, uh, we knew their files better than they did, because of course we were looking in the files and we were examining everything. Now, one question that people ask is, well, weren't there records that were destroyed over the years? Well, yes, there were. I'm sure there were records that were destroyed before we got into action uh, 30 years after the assassination. The uh, voluminous collection maintained by James Angleton at the CIA, for example, was largely destroyed when he was fired from his job as the chief of counterintelligence in about 1975. So those records are gone. Some of J. Edgar Hoover's records were burned upon his death. So, those are, so there are records that have disappeared over the years. But you know, I found in doing this work that if a record had been destroyed at the CIA, likely you could find a copy of that record at the State Department, or at the FBI, or at the National Security Agency. There were copies of records galore throughout the federal government. So when uh, the Secret Service destroyed a group of records that we were seeking, they said they did so inadvertently. Uh, they were the, uh, the threat assessment uh, uh, records uh, before uh, the November 1963 period. Uh, we we found copies of all of that in uh, another in the FBI uh, agency files. The FBI, fortunately, uh, I like to give them credit for something when I can. They kept all their records in, in very well organized fashion. You didn't have to look very far to find FBI records. The CIA, on the other hand, uh, they had no clue where records were in their filing system. They were often uh, in warehouses. They were misfiled, and we had a hard time really finding uh, all of the detailed records within the CIA. Um, just a few uh, uh, efforts that we did. Uh, we hunted for a lot of extra records. Uh, New Orleans. Uh, Professor Fetzer this morning mentioned uh, the, the Garrison investigation and prosecution of Clay Shaw. Well, we went to New Orleans seeking to, to get as many records as we could. Uh, a cousin of one of Clay Shaw's uh, former partners came forward with a diary that Shaw had written during the trial, which is very interesting, now part of the collection. Um, we held a public hearing and in New Orleans, and the district attorney said, I will help you with whatever you want. All of our records are yours. Nothing's been destroyed. Well, watching that hearing at the time was an investigator that the, the DA had fired not long after uh, he'd come on board. Uh, this guy had, uh, uh, was fired because he had refused at the time to destroy the grand jury records that Garrison had used <coughs> during his process.
prosecution of Clay Shaw.